Good morning and welcome to Sacred Awakenings. You found us at our Sunday gathering. This is a time we come together in celebration of intention, prayer, meditation, music, and message. Today's message is presented by Reverend Cher Trenholm. We welcome her back. And her message today is titled Good Grief. And we also enjoy the music again of John and Lori Lefevre Johnson. They have a beautiful way of taking us deeper into ourselves and into the message of spirit through song. So welcome and enjoy today's gathering. Just take a moment to connect with breath, connect with your heart, connect with yourself, connect with your soul, and we'll set the intention for today's gathering. Coming together, we create a collective divine heartbeat. We affirm truth and peace abide here. We gather to remember and recognize the divine mystery within. In our sacred circle, we honor the awakenings of each spirit who enters. Earth Teach Me, a Native American prayer. Earth, teach me quiet, as the grasses are still with new light. Earth, teach me suffering, as old stones suffer with memory. Earth, teach me humility, as blossoms are humble with beginning. Earth, teach me caring as mothers nurture their young. Earth, teach me courage as the tree that stands alone. Earth, teach me limitation as the ant that crawls on the ground. Earth, teach me freedom as the eagle that soars in the sky. Earth, teach me acceptance 
as the leaves that die each fall. Earth, teach me renewal as the seed that rises in the spring. Earth, teach me to forget myself as melted snow forgets its life. Earth, teach me to remember kindness as dry fields weep with rain. Aho. Perhaps love is like a resting place, a shelter from the storm. It exists to give you comfort, it's there to keep you warm. And in those times of trouble, when you are most alone, the memory of love will bring you home. Perhaps love is like a window, perhaps an open door. It invites you to come closer, it wants to show you more. And even if you lose yourself and don't know what to do, the memory of love will see you through. Oh, love to some is like a cloud, to some is strong as steel. For some a way of living, for some a way to feel. Some say love is holding on, some say letting go, and some say love is everything, and some say they don't know. Perhaps love is like the ocean, full of conflict, full of pain, like a fire when it's cold outside, or thunder when it should live forever and all my dreams come true my memory of love will be of you my memory of love will be of you my memory of love will be of you Hello, dear ones. This is Reverend Cher Trenholm, and I'm so happy to be back at Sacred Awakenings with you. And I want to thank Nicole and also our wonderful musicians for the work today. You know, Charlie Brown is in high school now, and he went to his career advisor. And the advisor said, Charlie Brown, I think you'd make a good grief counselor. Go, Charlie Brown. Our topic today is good grief. And friends, we're going to bring awareness to three areas. First, misconceptions about loss and grief in our culture. Secondly, we're going to examine collective grief through building ourselves a collective grief layer cake so we can visualize that. And part three, we're going to explore how to effectively heal from losses through the grieving process. So let's start with misconceptions. In our society, many people do not typically understand grief. When someone dies, we might send a card or go to the funeral, but beyond that, many people don't have much experience with grief outside of losing a loved one or a pet. Now, often people confuse grief with law, with pain. So loss brings the pain, and grief is the healing. So loss is what happens. And grief is the way that our body and our mind deals with the painful experiences and loss. Unfortunately, society teaches us not to acknowledge our grief. We think pain is bad. Well, it certainly doesn't feel good. 
but we think the goal is to get out of pain as soon as possible. And the net result is rather than honoring our grieving process, we shut it down. And we might hear people say or think to themselves, I'm going to pull myself up by the bootstraps. I'm going to do it for my kids. Or I got to get back to work and keep busy, keep my chin up, move on. Well, again, the erroneous idea is if we stop grieving, we stop the pain. But the truth is we stop the healing. But the pain remains submerged in our hearts and minds, and that's where you see people can get stuck. And they get in long-term pain, depression, anxiety, all symptoms related to unresolved grief. Also in our culture, people may feel awkward or uncomfortable because they don't know how to comfort someone who's grieving. So well-meaning words meant to soothe do just the opposite. Let's do something fun. I'll say a common phrase people might say after a loss. And at the end, we're going to add, so stop feeling so badly. Okay, so I'll say the phrase, I can't hear you, but say it right along with me. And, and then say, so stop feeling so badly. Ready? You're lucky you had them for as long as you did. So stop feeling so badly. He's in a better place. Stop feeling so badly. I know just how you feel. So stop feeling so badly. Everything happens for a reason. So stop feeling so badly. You'll become stronger through this experience. So stop feeling so badly. Now, who is it that wants to stop feeling so badly? It's the person who's uncomfortable with the feelings and the grieving. This is the best book that I've found on grief. It's called okay, It's Okay That You're Not Okay. And it's by author Megan Devine. It'll be on the website. Because we don't talk about loss, Megan says, even small losses, most people think of grief and loss as aberrations, detours from a normal, happy life. And she says, you know, even the medical community calls grief a disorder. After the death of her husband, Megan was reading Wayne Dyer's book, there's a spiritual solution to every problem, and it just wasn't resonating for her. And then she realized that grief isn't a problem. It's a solution. There's nothing wrong with grief. It's a healthy response to loss. It's, it's actually a natural extension of love. In my view, Loss and love are intertwined parts of our life. I believe we feel loss because we love. Maybe it's true that the deeper we love, the stronger we feel our loss. So now let's examine our next section, collective grief and layers of loss. Globally right now, we are experiencing multiple layers of collective grief and loss all at the same time. And so to help us visualize, let's build a collective grief layer cake. Okay, so I'm going to mix it up, and here's the bottom layer of the cake. Climate change. Collectively, our lives are all affected by the cataclysmic changes to our Mother Earth. Loss of forests, fish, and animal habitats. Loss of clean air, clean water due to industrial pollution and burning of fossil fuels. We've also lost our soil viability 
which degrades our food and our nutrition and our health is threatened by microscopic little plastic pieces, ubiquitous in our environment, from fish at the bottom of the ocean floor to the cells in our body. Many people worldwide are experiencing loss of shelter from drought, from floods, from rising oceans, and from famine due to mismanagement of world resources and, and I believe that's causing global warming. Now I want to talk about anticipatory grief. What anticipatory grief means is it's a feeling when you're grappling with a loss that a greater loss is coming along. And so you're anticipating something even worse. So living with anticipatory grief is very stressful. Let's put on layer two, Kajung, the instability of our governments worldwide. Globally, there are ever more movements to take over our democracies and rule by autocracy. And we need only look at Hungary and Brazil as examples. And similar political unrest is happening in many countries worldwide, from Myanmar, Yemen, Colombia, Venezuela, even Russia. So while we got the cake here, let's slather on some frosting there. That represents the January 6th insurrection against our government and the rise of terrorism and white supremacy in the U.S. We've lost our peace and tranquility and faith in our government. Around the world and, and here in the U.S., sadly, people have been manipulated through hateful rhetoric, through fear-mongering, and misinformation campaigns for political and personal gain. We have been intentionally divided, and so we've lost our unity as neighbors and friends and even family. Look at this week's headlines. Facebook deliberately included incendiary posts in order to create conflict and vision and more money. So in this layer, we also see the loss of our power to the mega rich, to big businesses who are changing laws without people's knowledge or consent. The gap between the haves and the have-nots has never been wider. And our cake is getting so heavy, it's absolutely wobbling. But let's add another layer. The third layer is, it's a heavy one, the pandemic. To me, we've been in a defensive position, really a war against an unseen foe, 24-7 for well over a year, almost two now coming up. Deaths now top 700,000, not counting those who have long-term conditions, the grieving of those families is unfathomable to me. Collectively, I think we we're all thrown off guard by the pandemic. And when a collective disaster happens, the effect is to be in shock and to shut down. And again, grief work is so important because if we submerge our pain, and it's, then it's not accessible to our hearts and minds to be dissolved by our grief process. Megan Devine says, if we can't scrutinize the sources of our discomfort, then they manifest in other ways. One of the most common responses to collective loss is a feeling that the world is out of control. That can be exhausting. And when our sweet souls have to carry so much collective loss, the effects can be severe. Here's a list of common physical suffering responses to unresolved grief. See if any of these resonate 
for you. Sleep difficulties, insomnia or too much sleeping, jarringly explicit dreams or nightmares, brain fog, difficulty concentrating, forgetfulness, clumsiness, chronic fatigue or low energy, exacerbated health conditions and physical aches and pains. And let's not forget addictions. When Americans are stressed in this way, what do we do to relieve the pain? Do we go out and join a grief ritual? Heck no. We eat too much. We drink too much. We shop online. We watch mindless TV. We do too much social media. And the wine companies, boy, don't they have our number. Drug sales are up too. And as a result of this pandemic, today in the U.S., the rates of depression and suicide are very high, especially in those who are in their vulnerable teenage years. Now, I stayed home because I'm at risk due to asthma. And I waited till I was vaccinated. But that didn't make me safe from the isolation and the loss of connection. Thank goodness for Zoom. Because I have a confession. I'm a hugger. And I acutely feel the loss of my human need to be touched and to touch. And for me, in the early days of the quarantine, life just seemed to be like a general malaise. Like, you know, I don't know what day it is. Mm, I think it's Blur's Day. And then I started noticing that everyone I knew was going through something similar. And I thought, aha, this is collective grief. So this was a catalyst for me starting to run my first grief workshop. So what else have we lost? We lost our routines. Our, we lost our freedom to make plans, to see our friends to resume former activities. And many people put their lives on hold as far as postponing doctor appointments or elective surgeries or mammograms, physicals. And some people had financial losses or they lost their homes. And many people have the added loss of not being able to say goodbye to a loved one who died in an ICU ward alone. The worst part of COVID for me so far is that my husband and I saved all of our lives so that we could spend our retirement traveling the world. And this pandemic has stolen over two years from me that I, I won't be getting back. I had a moment of, you know, a conscious thinking about the people who are starving in the world or people with no sanitation. But, you know, I teach that the impact of one loss can't be compared to another loss. So I forgive myself. And to compound the situation, many people feel very insecure because misinformation is rampant. And maybe that's because the medical and the health professionals don't, really don't know much about the disease. So friends, here's our cake. I hope we've baked a cake that reflects that these times are collective loss. So many layers of grief occurring all at once. I think it's about to topple over. But now we're going to get into part three. And we're going to talk about ways to facilitate healthy grieving. You know, the Dalai Lama has said that pain is inevitable, and but suffering is optional. This is important. These ideas are not a substitute for going through the grief process. They're for soothing while we grieve. They could be for you or, or anyone who you're supporting through a time of grieving. Now, you may be familiar with the five stages of grief from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Denial, anger, bargaining, 
sadness acceptance. What I learned is that these stages were designed for people who were facing their own deaths. They aren't meant for people facing loss. Because there is no timeline for healing from a given loss. There isn't a set of stages to go through. Grieving's an organic process we move through. Sometimes we go forward, sometimes we go back. Each grieving process is unique. One experience doesn't translate to another. There are no linear timelines. Grieving is as unique as love. But dear ones, my sister was hit by a truck and killed when she was 49. I was 52. And one of my worst moments was having to tell my 80-year-old parents. Suddenly, I was an only child, and I felt responsible for going to California to retrieve her body and her stuff and seeing to her service and her burial and then looking after my, de my devastated parents. I felt numb for several months. And then one day, I woke up shrieking. And one of the best pieces of advice I got was from a teacher that worked next door to me. She had lost her son. And she said, go easy on yourself. Don't expect too much. What used to take you 20 minutes is going to take you an hour. That was helpful. So that's the number one tip here. If you're grieving, treat yourself well. In fact, create a self-care manifesto. Tend to yourself as you would a beloved child. You have been injured. and You need to heal. So eat well, rest, relax. Eliminate demands if you need to and reduce responsibilities if you're able to. Number two, accept that you will go through many different emotions and express them liberally. Spirit created tears to wash our souls and to wash our face. Number three, adopt a way to know God is there. In prayer or meditation, feel that soothing presence of spirit just enfolding you. And with the unconditional love of God, we can be reassured and comforted as we grieve. For goodness sake, know that God did not create this to punish you. It isn't some kind of karmic payback. Fourth, if God can speak directly to you, God can speak through others with words and gestures. And if you're called to help someone else, be a witness. Help your friend to feel supported and loved. As a listener, come from your heart. It's okay to feel awkward. Here's some helpful things to say. I just wanted to let you know that I'm thinking of you, praying for you, and grieving with you. I'm here if you ever need to talk. Can I bring you anything? My heartfelt condolences go out to you and your family. Now here are some practices which may be helpful. And you can do them alone or with a group. First, rituals. They can reduce your suffering and ease your pain. Light a candle, write a prayer. In Hawaii, on the anniversary of my sister Wendy's death, we would go to the ocean and throw a flower lei in to remember her life. Journaling is helpful. And even keeping a log to enhance your awareness of your thoughts and feelings. You can always look back on them. Give grief a voice. Write to your loss. Write 
to your higher power, right to your wounded self. There's another practice called Lectio Divina. What it is, you take a poem or a spiritual writing and you do four things. Read it, then reflect on it, then write your reflection, and then rest. It's a form of meditation. It's been very helpful. Anything in the arts, or the culinary arts even, or anything in nature can help soothe. If you need professional help, don't judge yourself or think that you're broken. You're putting yourself back together. And finally, making meaning from loss. In the immortal words of Forrest Gump, a life is, is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Loss is a natural component of life. Remember, grief's a process. In healthy grieving, we're not merely coping. We're moving toward healing our experiences over time. And we give ourselves the gift of being fully present to ourselves. Not to deny, not to distract, to stay with it, stay with it, to tend to ourselves and to our tender hearts. You don't have to grow from grieving, but you might. You might find more beauty, more purpose, more wholeness. But those who do choose to do so as an act of self-knowledge, and empowerment. You might use your loss and grief to con create an entirely new perspective. Here's an example. When Wendy died, many good things did eventually come out of it. For one, I was closer to my parents. My 17-year-old daughter took the death of her only aunt very hard. And then months later, she said, you know, Mom, carpe diem, seize the day. I learned that from Auntie Wendy. Grieving is heart work. Grieving any loss requires the presence of love, love for and from our spiritual source, love for and from ourselves and between really our inner soul, and our sometimes flawed human selves, and love for and from others. Author David Kessler, who worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, says in, this, in his book, Finding Meaning, we must not let our losses take us down. We can use them to expand our lives. Every loss has meaning. Finding meaning moves us toward deeper, unconditional love. Love for self, love for others, and love for life. Namaste. And now, friends, we're going to take some quiet time. And today... I invite you to just, wherever you are, sit back, relax. You can close your eyes if you wish or not. And I'd like to read you something. It's from David Kessler's book, Finding Meaning. And it's called The Parable of the Long Spoons. And David says, I tell people who feel stuck in grief, that the way forward is to help another person in grief. As Buddha says, if you are a lamp for someone else, it will brighten your path. So he says, if you can find it in yourself to give to someone else, it will help two people, the recipient of the kindness and you. And it will also help you to become unstuck 
without you even realizing it. The parable of the long spoons illustrates the point. A person is ushered through the gates of hell, where he's surprised to find that they are made of finely wrought gold. They are exquisite, as is the lush green landscape that lies beyond them. And he looks at his guide and in disbelief, it's all so beautiful, he says. This can't be hell. Now, when the tantalizing aroma of a gourmet meal catches his attention, he enters a large dining hall. There are rows of tables laden with platters of sumptuous food, but the people seat, seated around the tables are pale and emaciated, moaning in hunger. And as he gets closer, he sees that each person is holding a spoon, but the spoon is so long, he can't get the food into his mouth. Everyone is screaming and starving in agony. Now they go to another area where he encounters the same beauty he witnessed in hell. He sees the same scene in the dining hall with the same long spoons. But in heaven, the people seated at the tables are cheerfully talking and eating because one person is feeding the person sitting across from him. Heaven and hell offer the same circumstances and conditions. The difference is in the way people treat each other. Choosing to be kind creates one kind of reality, and choosing to be self-centered creates another.
has come to shine. All your dreams are on their way. See how they shine. If you need a friend, I am sailing right behind like a bridge over troubled water. In considering our message, our music, our meditation, as well as all the educational opportunities that Sacred Awakenings is developing for the community, we ask that you consider a love offering as an energy exchange at our website, sacredawakenings.org. Any donation over $1 is eligible for our membership, which includes private access to various groups, workshops, and classes focused on furthering our spiritual exploration as a community. Please join me in this blessing. Divine love, through me, blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Divine love, through us, blesses and multiplies all that we have, all that we give, and all that we receive. May your generosity you share with Sacred Awakenings continue to bless you with divine abundance and prosperity. Thank you. Incredible gratitude to you, Cher, for sharing such a beautiful message. Good grief. Thank you for showing us that there is hope and we can have incredible healing And that grief doesn't have to be feared. And thank you, John and Lori, for sharing your beautiful gifts of music and song with us, taking us deeper into ourselves and into the message. And I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us live on Zoom today. And if you'd like to watch the video again, you can catch us on YouTube. You can catch all the Sunday gatherings in our private online member network. And if you want to hear just the message portion of the gathering again, you can find us um, on podcast. So feel free to look us up, stay connected, and I'll see you again soon. Also, if you'd like to stick around after our closing prayer here on Zoom, We'll take a few moments to um, connect with Rev Share, ask questions, maybe share how the message of good grief settled for us, and um, just support each other in our exploration. If I don't see you after the gathering for the chat, then I look forward to seeing you again next week. And now for our final prayer and meditation. And I invite you to gently close your eyes, take some deep cleansing breaths, breathing in and breathing out, breathing in divine light and breathing out anything that does not serve you in this moment. Wisdom, releasing everything else. And with each breath, we relax and begin to listen to our prayer from our hearts. So 
Holy Spirit, the gift day. We embrace all of life as a gift. All beings in our world are gifts. Our family, our friends, our neighbors, and strangers are all gifts to be savored. And we are grateful in this moment to be alive. Although some days may be full of hardship and sadness, each breath, each heartbeat, and each thought illustrates the beautiful gift of life. We pray that we may see that love and compassion can help us grieve, help us heal, and take us to a new place of understanding for our lives. Divine love, we draw on you to nurture and sustain ourselves and others along our journey. We ask to be guided in this process going forward into our lives. We keep our hearts open to receive wisdom and strength. And so we say, thank you, God for the blessings of the past, present, and future. And in the name of all the holy names of God, we say, Amen. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I've got the light of green. Feel free to get up and move around, stretch your legs, take a little break, do whatever feels right for you, and then we'll come back together in just a few moments, and we'll explore the topic of good grief a little deeper, and we'll explore the message, the music, the meditations, the prayers, however you felt your Sunday gathering. We'll share and explore together. And as always, you're not under any obligation to share anything at all. You are always welcome to stay 
to gather in the vibration of the gathering and, and simply receive the conversations and the energy of the morning. So thank you for coming and I look forward to chatting with you very, very soon.